here. Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. And today we are going to be doing a special interview with Miss um, Shy. I say Shy because I can not pronounce her whole name. Um, but we are doing a special um, interview with Miss Shy to talk to her about um, issues that she has been having with navigating the healthcare system um, and particularly about her illness that she is has been diagnosed with and has been suffering with for a couple of years. Um, so we are going to wait for her to get on the line so that we can talk to her um, specifically about her about her diagnosis, about being an advocate for herself, which is always what we talk about on the Speak Up Inspire series, but also about the healthcare system and how the healthcare system has um, been an injustice to her, um, as well as many others, um, including myself. So we are going to talk to Mishai very soon, um, but very briefly for the month of... What is, I don't even know the month this is. For the month of November, we are showcasing entrepreneurs. So all this month, we have entrepreneurs that we are going to be talking to in the months of November and December. And December. <laughs> now, we always have entrepreneurs on our show, or we always have business owners on our show. Um, however, these two months, we are going to be really focusing on um, people who have built their own businesses, built their own brands, um, talking to them about how they are, how they went about um, building a successful business, um, giving tips and resources to to everyone that's going to listen and um, tune in during the Entrepreneur Showcase, um, and then talking about their brand, talking about what they do, talking about their services um, that they provide. So for the month of November and December, I hope that you will join us every Monday at 8 as we talk to various entrepreneurs and business owners, not just here in the Queen City where I am, but all over. Um, so please make sure that you tune in on Monday evenings. I know that a lot of you that I see that are watching right now um, are faithful um, faithful viewers of the Speak Up and Inspire series. So I want to thank you for um, tuning in with us to um, being a part of our platform where we have a mission to highlight people that are doing great things in the community um, and that they are willing to speak up and inspire others to do the same. So the Speak Up and Inspire series is for people that are watching right now. Um, I see a couple of new people that are watching. The Speak Up and Inspire series was started to give a platform to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. From there, we saw or I saw the need for people in the community like you and me that are our neighbors, um, non, not celebrities, not politicians, not people that are um, making millions and billions of dollars, but everyday people like you and me that are doing great things in a community. So that is what inspired me to start this podcast for the Speak Up and Inspire series. We are going to be celebrating our one year anniversary in January. So Monday, January 13, 2020, we are going to be celebrating a whole year of showcasing people like you and me who are doing great things in the community, who are business owners, who are advocates, who are survivors, um, who are just doing really, really awesome things in the community to help others. So it's not about self. It's not about me. It's about helping others and sharing your knowledge, sharing your wealth, sharing your wisdom, sharing your experiences, uh, your services, your resources, so forth and so on. That is what we do here on the Speak Up and Inspire series. We share, we uplift, we advocate for, we support each other. And we do that by using our voices to speak up about whatever issue it is that you are passionate about and then inspiring others to do the same. So we're going to go ahead and invite Shai to join us. Um, even though this month is a showcase, we do sometimes do um, special interviews with either former guests who we were not able to successfully um, complete their interviews 
or people like Shai, who I feel have something that they need to talk about and something that they need to share. And so we will schedule special interviews. Um, our Monday, Monday night, 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 night
And my parents were business owners and entrepreneurs. So I learned from my parents about the um, importance of doing your own thing, having your own business, being successful at it. Um, and then also filtering it out into the community, still helping the community while being a business owner. So I grew up in a home full of business owners and full of entrepreneurs. And so I have been an entrepreneur and business owner ever since I was probably 19, 20 years old. Um, I'm not a millionaire in any way, shape or form when it comes to monetary value, but experience and rewards have been overflowing for several years. And that's because I'm giving back to the community. And I encourage everyone, regardless if you're a business owner or an entrepreneur, that if you have a passion about something that can help others to become an advocate and speak up and inspire others to do the same. Thank you, Allie. Hi, Katrina. If um, you have not heard Katrina yet, she is our new co-host for the Speak Up and Inspire series. So please go to our page and like our page so that you can um, check out Miss Katrina, see her, her bio that I put in there. You can also friend her on Facebook. And
children. So if you are a man and you have the time, even if it's just an hour a week to mentor or work with children in your community, I highly, highly recommend you get involved in your community and make a difference. If you're interested in being mentors with us and BVP Kids, we would love to have you. Um, it's a small time commitment. Working with great children. How are you? How are you? Is this better now? Um, it's still a little bit. Um, it's still a little bit. Is this Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so we're gonna just jump right in. Right jump right in. So tell us about. So, tell us about the. I think it's important. I think it's important to talk about anything else. Talk about anything else. Okay. Um, I have several diagnoses. Um, most of them fall under a branch called mast cell disease. And essentially, it's something that we all create. And it's a cell that's within our body that we create a histamine response to an allergen, to a product, or, or anything that our body essentially thinks is attacking itself. And for me, I overproduce that. <clears throat> and, well, at times over and underproduce it. When I'm overproducing, it's called systematic mastocytosis. When I'm underproducing it, it's called mast cell activation syndrome. That diagnosis I've now had for six years. It essentially causes me to go into anaphylaxis multiple times a day, every day. Even as we talk, you hear my voice change, you'll hear like, or you'll even like see my facial features kind of look a little strange, and it's because I'm having a reaction, and there's nothing I can do about it. <clears throat> um, Six years has been an adventure, to say the least, and I have learned to be present. It's not been easy. It hasn't been, um, I don't want to say not present, as it's definitely been a learning adventure. It's been something that I've learned to not really even cope with, but just manage. And I've learned that my strength comes from within and because of my own faith of God. I've learned to advocate. I've learned, like, I've learned a whole lot of different things in six years. And because of my cell activation, I've developed other conditions like dysautonomia. Dysautonomia is a condition where essentially your brain doesn't tell the rest of your body what to do. And so I can be sitting up straight like I am right now. And then if I stand up too fast, I'll fall over and I'll pass out. Very odd. Mm -hmm. And it's an increase of heart rate, and sometimes it's a very drastic decrease of heart rate, and that is also called POTS, or Postular Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. And yes, it's kind of a heart condition, but not really, as it affects your nervous system more than anything. As Like I said, I pass out at times, or I become extremely lightheaded. Like, sometimes I'll go over, and you'll me like listen i gotta get to the floor and it doesn't matter where i am i can be outside i can be in your home and i'll tell you i don't i don't care where i am i need to sit on the floor and i'll get asked constantly are you okay yes i'm fine i just need to sit here for a moment and it takes about 10 minutes sometimes 15 minutes for that feeling to go away and then i'm okay mostly um my heart rate is a little bit different i spend a lot of time in the hospital as you can probably imagine because of anaphylaxis and my resting heart rate. So yours is about 70, maybe 60, depending on a few things like blood pressure, and medical history and things like that. For me, mine is 120. I stand, mine goes up to 210. So I kind of scare nursing and medical professionals just, just a little bit. And wow. <laughs> I lie flat or completely flat. My heart rate goes down to 30. So I, I have, like, I've been in positions where the nurse sees me sleeping or a physician walks in and like sees the monitor and they're like, um, can we like do something about this? And, and I was like, oh yeah, I'm lying flat. So if there's nothing I can do about it. Um, systematic mastocytosis is a little bit new for me. 
although mast cell disease itself isn't. I just didn't expect to have both sides of this condition. Um, mm -hmm. One in every 10,000 individuals has a mast cell disorder to some sort. Um, of that 10,000, less than 2% have the condition of mast cell activation syndrome. Of that 2%, less than 1% have both sides of it. So I'm a bit of a unicorn, and I tend to have to educate medical professionals on how to care for me, especially being a person of color and being one of darker descent. I, I get the looks, I get the stares, I get the backlash, I get it all. I get, um, I don't want to say the best of both worlds because it's not, it's not even remotely close. Um, I get the okay, I get the negative, I get the, I hear you is what I get. Right. Right. Wow. That, that was, was a lie. That was a lie. <laughs> So you said you were dying in the 60s and 60s ago. Okay. So what was your first diagnosis? First diagnosis was in Atlanta, Georgia, by an allergist that practiced at North Cross. Uh, I don't know, I guess North Cross Hospital, but his office was at Emory. Mm -hmm. And at first, this all happened because of, well, I don't want to say happened because of, it all started rather. I was taking a class and someone sitting by me opened up a, like a snack container of peanuts. Mm -hmm. And it was, mm -hmm. I had been literally cut in half like um, the movie or the, um, the what is it, um, play called Phantom of the Opera, like where he's happy, where he wears a half mask. I really just thought it was just like my body wash because it has happened like, you know, I've had eczema. I'm like, well, I didn't think nothing of it. And and so then I went and made like a couple of days later, I made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for a kid and my hands went completely numb and turned purple. And it was like, that's a little different. Maybe I should avoid peanuts for a little while and maybe three nuts too. Let me just stay away from nut products. Friday... And I, I, why I remember specifically, it was on a Friday. I can't tell you the date though, but it was on a Friday. And I had had dinner with some friends at Fahrenheit. And you know, Fahrenheit is at the top of a hotel building. <laughs> and there's only one way up and one way down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had one dish that was cold. So I sent it back and got a steak. The steak had some sauce over it. And before becoming sick, I've done a lot of different things. Like I've worked in nursing. I used to own three businesses. I help nonprofits. Like I, I was literally like the, like they say, the jack of all trades. I was the Jackie of all trades. And I just learned and explored everything that I possibly could. Cause I loved it. And well, this particular night, all, I, I literally cut into the steak, and I, I didn't say too much of it. And I thought it smelled a little odd, like the sauce. And this sauce literally just touched my tongue, and I didn't even, like, get to chew it. Sesame seed oil. Put me in the hospital for three weeks, intubated. For a week. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so since then, um, that first allergist re, um, recanted his diagnosis, or basically it said, yeah, I don't really support that anymore. Mm -hmm. I know that she has anaphylaxis or I know that she goes into these things, but I don't really support it anymore. Okay, well, then time for me to move on from you. And I was filing for disability, and then I almost got it the first time. And then because of his statement, like that one statement got me denied. Yeah. And yeah. so it was like, okay, well... <laughs> I guess I better wait for a little while. And then, you know, in six years, I've been intubated or placed on a ventilator, a device. For those that don't know, it's a device that breathes for you. Like, you are no longer mm -hmm. capable of doing so. Mm -hmm. I've been put on that machine 43 times in six years. Right. 
<laughs> one time too many. <laughs> right. 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 And in the last two years, I have been in cardiac arrest six times. So like literally full on chest compressions, shock advice, like defibrillator, the whole nine yards. Yeah. But you know, I truly believe in God and I'm still here <laughs> regardless of all that I've been through. And like, I, I know, and I get told constantly, you know, you are a walking testimony to others. Right. And I said, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. And, but outside of that, like, I, I found another allergist, Dr. Theodore Lee in Atlanta. And this man has literally saved my life literally more than once. And because I, um, the, the first allergist, after he recanted his, his diagnosis, I was frustrated and pissed because yeah. I mean, there's truly no other way yeah. for it. I learned to, okay, so what do I do now? This physician's like, oh, well, just go to Harvard. Well, who am I supposed to go see at Harvard if you don't tell me? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he said, well, I don't know, just, just go. And I said, okay, well, you're no longer my physician. How about that? <laughs> and so I just... I went on a, like, literally a life-saving search and found Dr. Lee, and I've sent several other patients to him, and some that are in North Carolina, like Connie, who's watching, and uh, Michelle, I think she might be, or watch, we'll watch later, and I've learned that this journey is definitely one that I am meant to show others mountains really can be moved. Um, and Dr. Lee told that yeah. to me, and he's like, you know, you are really, really sick. Even if others don't see you that way, even if you come into my office or your PCP's office, he's like, you don't need to sit here and act as if you have to hold the world on your shoulders. And But I do when it comes to my health because yeah. no one else is going to push. No one else is going to I go through me. And so, right. Right. being in Atlanta, and me being here, it's it's a challenge. It's it's hard. Um, so then I found a Charlotte allergist, and she used to work with him. And what mm-hmm. happened was, and we, she's no longer my allergist. Um, she is a, a um, she's a physician that is this is how I want things and this is how things go and what I say is real and what I say is so. And that may be so for you, but it's not so for me. So, right. So, so, to diagnosis, how long was it? How long was it? Okay. Even when okay. I diagnosis. Okay. So how has it been? So how has it been? Um, I can I can already hear that it was already hear that it was I can find it back. I can find it back. So how has it been since you so how has it been since you found diagnosis? How has it been how has it been disability? Disability? I have found, I filed for disability a second time and was denied. And the second time, uh, the person, okay, so when you file with Social Security, there is essentially a worker, and she, he, she or he is the person that takes the information that you turn in, and they, you know, send it up to those that make the decision. And she also, well, in my case, she, she was, the person that also calls you to says, hey, you know, what other places have you been to for diagnosis? What other um, hospitals or physicians that can, you know, back up what you're saying? And so one of those things was well, one of my hindrances. She said that I was blind. Now, Tiffany, I'm pretty sure that I can see you and you can see me because I can see everything around me. Yeah, she mm-hmm. said that I was blind. Mm-hmm. So that didn't help me at all. And my last denial was in March of this year. I had until May to file for an appeal. And that didn't 
happened, I was kind of in the hospital intubated a little bit, so not really able to do so. But, um, you know, I guess really in the last two years, I've made some connections with some people in the Charlotte community that would really blow your mind. <laughs> and like Layla and Miss Judith and, you know, Miss Lisa Lee and Rodney and like like the list goes on and on and on and on. Like I, I literally have a whole bunch of people that I've been connected with. But Miss right. Judith specifically, right. she said, Chair, you're gonna to have to reach out to the senator. And I was like, Miss Judith, um how am I supposed to do that and why do I need to do that? And she's like, Because you have a disability and you were denied. I was like, yeah, so I just have to file again. And she was like, no, that's not how this works. Right. You talk to the senator. Right. The senator re sends in a letter for you on your behalf, and it's called a just cause. And, and then disability reopens that for you. And you allow that process to, for reconsideration to happen again. So I was literally just approved for that, I think, yesterday um, for for Social Security to reopen. So I don't have to file it all over. You know, won't have to get a lawyer, hopefully. Um, getting an attorney, they take out $6,000 or up to that amount, and I don't have time for that. Right. I, I've been through a lot. <laughs> and right. I yeah. just, I don't know. I wish I could, Sammy. I, that would be nice if people didn't get a lawyer. This is crazy, but I'm I'm definitely consistent. I'm definitely one that will will push you against the wall. As much as I've been pushed and you know put in a corner, I'm going to do the same thing to you. And I've learned to do it the correct way, and I've learned to do it in a way that I don't have to curse at you, but I promise you will hear me. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Um, I hear that. In very, I'm sure you have doctor's visits, doctor's visits, doctor's visits. Um, I do that. Um, no, I do that. Take disability cases, take disability cases at all, and, and keep them and all that. So, is that the reason why you might not? Um, so I'm not sure. Um, some of it, and I know that like they don't charge up front, but like. Okay, so I guess like really sharing me would would not be me if I didn't tell you that I struggled with homelessness. It would not be me if I didn't tell you that for probably close to two years, I lived in my car. And even going through all of this, and I need that money. I can't afford to give not even a good penny to a, to a lawyer. I just can't because mm. every cent mm. I need. Last year, like I was just approved for full North Carolina Medicaid under the traditional sense, I don't qualify at all. Um, I get told I qualify for family planning, which is a, <clears throat> a physical and birth control. I don't need either. I need a physician. I need several physicians to follow me consistently. Last year, from January until... I think I stopped counting at November, like the middle of November. My medical expenses were $3.7 million. And that was just my hospital. It did not include any um, office visits. It didn't include any specialists. Literally just for having to have a bed in the hospital. No medications, not having to be in ICU on a vent, like just a bed. Checking in. Shatarek, I have a wristband, so yes, let's let's start the register. Three point seven million dollars. Mm. I mm. have mm. learned to be quite resourceful and I've learned how to 
work the system appropriately and not in a negative way, but in a way that benefits me and so that way those that also deal with not just my condition but other health concerns that are like mine can can say, she did that. Let me reach out to her and figure out how she got through it and not just mm-hmm. she's just another person. Yeah, well, I can't imagine yeah. that. I can't imagine that. Are you with me? Are you with me? Wait, say that again? I said, I can't imagine that she can get more. Your health. Your health. Your health. 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 No. Um, I would like to, but one, I'm just not consistent. Like, like I like I said earlier, I um just didn't feel well earlier. And so I'm thankful that I have a few rescue meds left. I have a few of the medications that take me um out essentially of anaphylaxis. For example, like Benadryl, like what you would take by mouth for either when you can't fall asleep and it, you know, got a reaction to something. I take you probably usually take maybe twenty five to fifty milligrams. I take 75 milligrams via chest port, this Mm. device, Mm. and um, the amount that I take is equivalent to, I would say, maybe 100, if not 150 milligrams by mouth of what you take. I Mm. cannot take any Mm. by mouth. I don't take any meds at all by mouth because they all put me, ironically, into anaphylaxis. They all cause me Mm -hmm. to airway clothes, like... Literally, within seconds, airway closes. And I, I deal with that every day, but when I subject myself to things that I know I don't need or I know I cannot do, it only puts me at greater risk. And so working, it, it's just not, I want to, I really do. Because there's so many things that I want to give back to. There's so many things that I want to be able to do. And... I don't want to say can't at the moment, not really feasible. Yeah. And I understand yeah. that. And I understand um, that. Um, I've been dealing with chronic I've been pain, with chronic pain, pain. Um, spreading through my body. Spreading through my body. Um, I apply for food before. before. Um, um, but there's um, times I can There's times I can talk. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 i am 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 I have pain every day. I have pain every day. And so it's a big problem with the healthcare system. For people who need it, and 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 people who need it, I wrote a letter, something called Just Cause, and it essentially says why you um, why you feel as though your claim of denial should be reopened for an appeal. And so, like, my page, my letter is four pages long. And then his constituent or his liaison reached out to me and, because, um, well, I reached out to him first, and I said, well, did you read it? And he says, well, I've glanced through it. And I said, no, I need you to read it. And I need for Senator T- um, Tillis to read it. And he says, okay, Ms. Melton, I'll give you a phone call back. 20 minutes later, he calls me back. And he says, Ms. Melton, you were denied disability because of all of, like, with all of these things going on? And I said, yeah. I said, please tell me how. Tell me how I'm supposed to be able to function, be able to have a, a yes or be able to have a a no in a society that says that you need to be able to function and be able to give back or or do something within society that is not just productive but in a work environment. I'm not safe anywhere. I have been told 
But why don't you just try it out and not say something to someone and just see what happens? I said, what are we doing? We playing with my life? We playing death? Or, you know, rush roulette? Or what we yeah. what we what are we playing? Yeah. I can't. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. now because, I can't yeah. really because, with everything. Right. Because I right. imagine. Because I imagine. You were going through this daily. Going through this daily. You could be. You at could work be at work. Don't want to respond. And that can be detrimental to and your that can be detrimental to your yeah. 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 So, you know, you know, you know, um, to advocate for yourself. Well, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I can get a bit sassy, and I I can use words that are not the most pleasant. But who doesn't at times? And I'm trying to. You have a right to be. Sure, sure I do, but it's not helpful. What it says, you know, you know, with us being women of color, we already have a stigma. We already have the crown of angry black woman. And it is not a crown that we are very proud of. And it is one that I'm working very hard to get rid of. I'm working to get rid of the stigma because I personally am tired of it. I tend to run in a lot of non-brown um, descent individuals that think that it's okay to speak to me any sort of way, think that it is okay to denounce or to speak down to me. And and then when I can talk to you in the same medical language that you speak in, and then they kind of take a step back. They kind of say, oh. And then I get the, oh, well, you know too much. There's nothing really wrong with you then. There's, this is psychosomatic. This is, you know, Munchausen's or fictitious disorder. I've done that too. I've, I've fought that battle. I have even gone the route of, I said, okay, fine. You said that this is, this is a fictitious disorder. Where's, psychi where's psychiatry? So then psychiatry comes in. And then they tell Dr. So-and-so, this is not a psychological disorder. This is a medical condition. As I've spoken to her, I have literally watched her facial features, her body changes in front of me. I have watched her go through this and not, you know, not be able to function normally. Like, I remember last year, particularly, like last year, and at the end of October, I was supposed to go see Dr. Lee. I got on the plane. I don't fly commercially. I couldn't fly um private aircraft through a company called um, uh, Angel Flight Source or Angel Flight Source. And so they provide free medical flights for individuals like myself and those of other medical conditions that can't get around. You know. And so I wasn't feeling that well. I was over at a friend's house that washed some clothes and get in the air for the two and a half, three hour flight. I was literally vomiting the entire time. We land, and I told him, I said, I need for you to call for EMTs as we get ready to land. And he did. It took them a little bit to get to us. I was in the bathroom, like literally, like head to toe, covered in vomit. And so I stripped down. EMTs have now come to me. I've now given myself three epis, 75 milligrams Benadryl, and they're now looking at me. Um, you're getting ready to pass out. And sure enough, I did. And I landed at Emory St. Joseph's Hospital until the end of January of this year. So the end of October last year until the end of January of this year. And that experience was by myself. I had physician after physician that literally told me, there's no way that this is real. There's no way that you can go through something like this. This doesn't exist. This is something that you have come up with. And I've seen another patient that call themselves trying to have this condition and you just you you are the reason that this this is here. I said, oh, I said, is that so? So I carry I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, right. Like and then on top of that, you know, I don't I'm not consistent like with um 
with how I rep present in, while I'm in like a full on anaphonic reaction, I'm not consistent. But mm -hmm. I carry mm -hmm. a notebook with me here. I'll show you. So I carry this notebook, like literally everywhere that I go. And in so like the first page tells you I have a chest port because I have had people, I've had nine pick lines in um, less than a year. Mm. I have an emergency contact list. I, I mean, like I have down to the date of procedures, where it was done at, who did it, like date of admission. These are some of my allergies, some of them, nowhere near close to all of them. So these are the ones that you need to know in the event that you need to intubate me or you need to give me something that is going to save my life <laughs> and how to do it. Well, and then this sheet is from Dr. Lee, who is, has his, um, you know, his, his logo on it and his, he signed it. And yeah, so then this is my position list. And these are all the letters that I carry everywhere with me. And I still get physicians that, that say, no, not real. You, you put this together. You somehow get into the computer system and you create and construct this. Yeah. I've, it's been to that extreme. It has been to the extreme of, you, you know, I've, I've needed to have to have had sitters in my room. And then the nurse walks in and is like, why do you have a sitter? I said, well, you tell me. You, Y'all said that I somehow break into your system that I have not worked in in well over 10 years. And somehow I <laughs> write these letters and I, you know, put in for my own meds. And I put in for, for me to take care of myself and tell you what to do and how to do it. And I said, yeah, because that makes complete and total sense. I think I might be in federal prison if I did something like that. I said, I'm not yeah. stupid. Yeah. Um, somebody um, uh, asked me. Um, um, I, I have two questions. One, one, your diagnosis. Your diagnosis. It, does it stem it from. It stem from, from. Is that where it's stemming from? Is that where it's stemming from? Yes. So, mastal activation is, is what my allergic syndrome is why I have so many allergies because my body is constantly thinking oh my gosh you're near something oh my gosh you've eaten something or you've like mm -hmm. I've had reactions to sitting still and that's called idiopathic anaphylaxis like literally sitting just like this and you know airway closes completely I've had a reaction to taking a shower because of the water like, and then you know pass out in the shower and literally airway closes wow. yeah so wow. very bizarre very, very bizarre. Wow. My second question. My second question. Who wanted to? Who wanted to? Yeah. Yeah. Presidents. Have you? Have you? How, how far are you reaching? How far are you reaching? Support that you need. I tried. Um, I've actually tried a few times. Um, individuals like Tara Long, Shalaki, um, Shalaki Edwards have also tried, and they've reached out to individuals at Fox 46, at um, WCNC, and uh, what, what's the other one? NBC, like ABC. Like, yeah, I've, I've reached out, and I even, like, talked to a producer for Oprah. And, you know, I guess it's it's so far out there or because it's not as common as we expect for it to be and because I experience it in such a different way that it's like, how do I know that that's actually real? Hmm. But at the same hmm. time, I can't, I can't produce, I can't like, I can't make any of this happen. And and not just that, but, like, even if you didn't believe me, even if you chose to say, well, I don't know about that. I have invited others and said, hey, fine, you don't believe it? Okay. You want to come to a doctor's appointment with me? Why don't you sit here with these two, three hour appointments that I have to sit through and have physicians literally like, um, 
Um, so here, what, what do you think we should do? No. Oh, no. I mean, I can't. I mean, I can't. I know. I know. I know that I can log in to and some of it to be fair to the medical community i must be fair at the same time like for example if i'm an anaphylaxis and if i have an epipen and if i'm able to bring myself out of it i'm doing so so I can do medications that will reverse a reaction, but at the same time, if I've done so before getting to a medical facility like CMC Pineville, CMC Maine, or um, Presbyterian or whatever, and then I can see like right side of my face is like shifting. Um, but doing so, and you're wanting to do blood work, you're not going to find a serum triptase, you're, which determines how much of an allergic reaction are you having right now. It gives you a number. And because I've had epinephrine, you're not going to get it. And so what will happen? They'll run this and they'll say, oh, she's not having an allergic reaction. Right. But, you've already, right. You've already, right. Mm-hmm. Right. So mm-hmm. I've already masked what, what's happening. And so then even if you wait, I, I'm the unicorn that has what we call biphasic or secondary reactions. And mm-hmm. secondary reactions can happen anywhere from after the first administration of epinephrine up until 72 hours later, so three or four days later. Mm-hmm. Been there, done that. And it's hard. It's very, very hard to have someone sit and tell you that, oh, this is just not possible. This just, yeah, I just don't believe you. But at the same time, when I'm when I can tell you I'm not in a reaction right now, I don't feel the greatest, I don't feel the worst. But if you want to draw where my labs are right now, I can tell you that you might find where my triptase is. And I've had a bone marrow trans- like a bone marrow biopsy, and that's you know they flip you over on your back and they go through your hips and they pull it out. And <clears throat> I've had that happen, and it was done incorrectly. So, as an adult, you are not sedated for that procedure, like, no. And so, I, I need to have that redone. Um, I won't be having it redone here in North Carolina. I'll be having it done in Mississippi as one of the conglomerate um, secondary conditions that mass all produces is something called electroparesis, or I mean gastroparesis, sorry. And I essentially don't digest food, and it literally sits in my stomach and does not move. And so I just vomit and vomit and vomit. And, and so, and then it also causes like belly distension, like a whole just, yeah, yeah. it just causes yeah. a bunch of stuff. Are there any research studies that are looking into the not to you specifically, Not but specifically, but we research studies. Yeah, both me and in other studies. Yes, um, and me is at Emory. Um, however, we ha- I have to get closer to um, more stability. I'm just not right now um, enough to say well. Today and tomorrow, I can go fly to to Atlanta and go straight to Emory. And so they're waiting for, for that to kind of happen. But no one knows when that will happen. As a whole, yes, um, there is research done right now it, at Atlanta Emory it, in Boston, Massachusetts, at Brigham and Women's. There is a Master Cytosis Society Clinic, um, of course, Mayo Clinic, um, mm-hmm. and that one's in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the NIH. Um, I have been asked and have put in an application as well as a couple of my physicians have put into, they call it the center of the unknown um, diagnosis. And so I'm waiting mm-hmm. for the NIH to come back to me with that. Although unfortunately with this condition, there are 
a few pioneers of research. Dr. Lawrence Afrin, who used to be at uh, Mayo Clinic in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was supposed to go on this to see him there. Well, then he decided to go to New York and he opened up his own clinic and would love to go see him, him and his partner, um, Tanya Dempsey, but I don't have $6,000 to pay him out of pocket because he no longer accepts insurance, period, at all. And so because this is rare, it's almost a, I guess from a physician's perspective, I can make as much money as I can off of this. And that's unfortunate. Right. Individuals like myself have to go through this. Like, and six grand is literally your first two appointments up front, and then every appointment yeah. after that, fifteen or yeah. yeah. And so it's yeah. truly yeah. highly. Yeah. Katrina says Emory is a great hospital in Atlanta. Well, Katrina, I got news for you, Sunshine. I've seen good and bad, and Emory's not the best. So. Um, <laughs> I guess it's like, it depends on the person and your experience. And I have, I've experienced something and it's solely my race. I've experienced something that is not fair. I've experienced life, um, this, no, no, no. I've experienced this journey to me literally chasing life and not the life that I had. Literally chasing a life that I am trying to get to because of my race because of being a woman and it's not fair it's not okay and so i advocate for that i advocate for myself to be able to have care if nothing else just to have care but i also advocate for the injustices that as a person of color as an individual of brown descent have to fight literally every single day that because like even today, my primary care provider, who right now at the moment I'm quite quite living with, but that that's completely different. If if I already know as a patient that my medical complexities are a struggle, my medical complexities are one that is going to take more time than the five or ten minutes that as a PCP, as a internal medicine physician that you are willing to take and spend time into my room that I'm currently in right now, that's a problem for one, for the normal society. But that's an even bigger issue for me with someone with chronic health conditions. And so I literally had to interview physicians. I interviewed almost a hundred in fact. And and he was the one that was said to me and that I saw initially when I was doing all research as he says, I like little mysteries. Okay, fine. So I meet you on an initial appointment, and I say, listen, I, I need these things. I am going through this, 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 and this. These are the physicians that I currently have. This is what I would like to have done. What is it that you see, and what is it that you can help me with? If I present to you as a physician all of these, the different things, black and white, out on the table, because for me in medicine, um, you physicians, medical professionals see things objectively, like what is tangible that I can get my hands on to to um, to not just say, oh, well, I can see that, but to also say, oh, this is something that is acknowledgeable. This is something that I understand where she's coming from when she says that she feels this or she feels that. Okay, fine. But when they don't have those things, it's hard for them to have a diagnosis to back up with. I get that too. So I provided literally all of that for you in black and white. And, and then my second visit with you, which I actually consider that because it's then, okay, well, that now, now we are getting into, we are open the book. We're going to see like where I really am. I want you to do some blood work so that way you can get to know me. And when that doesn't happen or when it happens in a way that as a physician, and I ask you questions, and you sit like this, and you tell me, okay, and that's your response to literally everything that I said. That's a problem, because this patient, I promise you, wants to know everything about a lab, wants to know everything about a scratch, a mark, a, a swell, literally wants to know everything. And when you can't provide her with an answer, she's going to dig into it, and she's going to come back to you and go ask you, hey, so I found this. What do you think? Yeah. So I did that. Yeah. Um, particularly with electrolytes. 
I can't um, maintain or keep enough electrolytes in me. But Gatorade is not enough Gatorade in the world for me. I can have my potassium and magnesium replaced. Four hours later, it's gone. Um, same thing with with blood. I may have seen, like, I was in the hospital recently and needed to have a blood cleanse. And, you know, like, I expressed this to him. I said, um, I have to have a blood transfusion. What, what do you think about that? What am I saying? And I said, I'm extremely aching. And my toes are going numb. I said, so my potassium must be low. And he says, well, how do you know? I said, well, this definitely isn't my first radio. I said, so can, can we do a blood, can we do a BMP is what it's called, and a magnesium, basic metabolic panel. We did that. Having to it is hard to I don't really I like really it. like what you need, you need, what it is, what it is. Um, um, learn about your life, about your life, understand, understand, um, 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 to life, to life, but make that make that, um, um, frustration, frustration, so I want to tell you, overwhelming it's mm -hmm. it's overwhelming at times for me even to like like introducing new physicians for example it's just like I have to be like word vomit and get it all out at once and then it's like you've definitely educated you've us definitely kind of educated kind of us kind of it was a lot it was a lot of information uh, that's the information that you bring to me that So now we're going to talk so now. We're going to talk that. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you, everybody, for watching. You know, you know.